Hey everyone, it's the Monty Man, and you are about to take part in the experience, the strength, and the hope of this episode of the Take 12 Recovery Radio Show. Three, two, one, zero. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Come here for a minute. I want to talk to you. Against the wall, can't find peace of mind. Brain needs an overhaul. The views expressed on this broadcast of the Take 12 Recovery Radio Show are those of the co-host and guest and do not necessarily reflect those of our affiliates. The topics and opinions on today's show should not be considered as medical, psychological, or professional advice. Take 12 Radio is not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. And now, here's your host, The Man, The Myth, The Legend, The Monty Man. Well, welcome to the show, everyone. This is the time of the month where we bring to you some of the best of our shows from our archives. And in this uh, show, we are featuring Dr. Jamie Marich and Dan Griffin. Now, both of these folks really do carry a lot of weight when it comes to the topic of trauma and our recovery. Have we missed the boat by simply telling people 90 meetings in 90 days, don't drink and use in between meetings, get a sponsor, work the steps, uh, clean house, serve God and others, and we just send them on their way. Or have we missed something vitally important? Maybe so. You decide. So here is the show from our archives with Dr. Jamie Merritt and Dan Griffin on trauma and the 12 steps. We got just a great treat for you on this show uh, today. I mean, th- this is this is really, and we got some surprises that you may not know about my guest. Uh, Dr. Jamie Merritt uh, is on the show with us, uh, and uh, Dan Griffin is on the show. Let me tell you about these these two characters. I I, mean, I just think the world of both of them. <clears throat> Jamie has worked in mental health residential treatment and in chemical dependency treatment as an inpatient, outpatient, and dual diagnosis counselor. Jamie obtained her PhD in counseling studies from Capella University and an MA in counseling from the Franciscan University of Steubenville. Jamie also teaches for several reputable online universities, and she offers original workshops for counselors and social workers on a regular basis throughout the country. She is also the author of a fantastic work uh, book called Trauma and the 12 Steps. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit about that. And uh, Dan Griffin... Uh, he has worked in the mental health and addictions field for almost two decades. He's the author of the great book, I recommend it highly, A Man's Way Through the Twelve Steps, uh, and that is published by Hazelton. This is the first trauma-informed book taking a holistic look at men's experience in uh, of recovery from addictions. He is the co-author of Groundbreaking Curriculum, Helping Men Recover, the first trauma-informed curriculum to deal with men's unique issues and needs. Both of these people that are just amazing to me are extremely talented. And what some of you may or may not know is both of them are also what I consider recovery recording artists. They both have great voices. They both, uh, they sing. Uh, Dan plays a guitar. Uh, Jamie, do you play an instrument? I play guitar and violin, yes. Guitar and violin. Dan, Mm -hmm. have you touched the violin yet? 
Uh, no, but I do play piano. Piano. Okay, so so we both got dual diagnosis here on both of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, please. <laughs> Well, um, we're, we're going to be hearing some music from both of these uh, uh, fine folks, uh, but we're going to be talking today about trauma. And this is this is one of uh, this is really like the favorite topic uh, with these guys. Uh, you guys have worked together before on presentations, correct? Uh, yeah, we had yeah. a chance to do one presentation together and we do a lot of I don't know, Dan, how would you call it? Just what I consider collaboration in terms of talking to each other. And you know, getting some experience, strength, and help about what it's like to be teaching this trauma message out there to people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know what's nice is that we're learning from each other and growing and evolving our thinking. Um, and I think we also take very seriously the idea that the mantle is being passed from one generation to the next, and, and we know that we're part of that next generation and um, feel very passionately about uh, this message about trauma. Dan, let me let me ask you: uh, wh- Why has the issue of trauma been overlooked for so long within the recovery community? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of ways you could approach that. I mean, interestingly enough, we've actually been talking about trauma for a long time. You know, kind of like we talked about addiction for a long time, but we didn't really have the research and the brain, uh, the understanding of the brain, until around 1990s, where they really just kind of catapulted forward as far as the understanding of the brain, and and as we've expanded our understanding of the brain, we've also kind of, quote-unquote, rediscovered trauma. So when we were talking about toxic shame and ACOAs and a lot of the stuff back in the 80s, even codependency, at the heart of that was trauma. And there were people like um, John Bradshaw and Tian Dayton, um, Pia Melody, who were using the word trauma. Um, but I think probably one of the biggest challenges, um, one of the things that I like to say is that, you know, we are a traumatized field and we work with traumatized clients mm. and then we send them to a traumatized recovery community. Uh, and, and I think that's part of why this has been overlooked. We've got so much untreated, undiagnosed trauma in and around um, the community that um, it's hard. It's hard to look at and it's hard to see. Similarly, like what happened with codependence, people started feeling like, my God, if I, if I pay attention to this, then everybody in my life, including me, is codependent. Right. Um, and then, and that's distinguishing between codependent behavior and then an actual kind of, code, you know, a codependent diagnosis, so to speak, or codependent disorder. And so there's traumatic experiences as well as those who have, you know, trauma disorders, which Jamie can speak to much more uh, eloquently than I can. Uh, uh, Jamie, you work with both men, men and women, correct? I do, yes. So who speaks more openly about their trauma, men or women? <laughs> you know, honestly, it depends on the person. Um, yeah. I, I've had several men come in, you know, very ready to heal. And I've had other men who have been very, you know, it's it's a stigma issue to, you know, I often say it's a bigger stigma to talk about your trauma than it is about your alcoholism or your addiction, especially in men. Um, you know, I don't like to make generalizations. I, I do think, you know, there's issues working with both genders, although, and I'm sure Dan could speak more eloquently about this, the field, you know, both mental health and addiction has tended to provide more support for women who want to specifically speak about trauma. Because I think we have, you know, identified now in the last two decades that, yes, a lot of women are traumatized and need that specific attention and, and specific uh, platform to be able to work with it. But I think as a result, a lot of our willingness to work with men about trauma, I don't want to say willingness, but our uh, readiness uh, to work with men on trauma has been kind of put on the back burner. Since I've I've met both you guys, and I've known Dan longer than you, Jamie, but but uh, in talking with both of you uh, over the years, w- what I've noticed while attending my own twelve step support meetings uh, that I never noticed before is I'm I'm hearing traumatic experiences constantly in the sharing. Um, I, I mean everything from sexual abuse. Uh, to spiritual abuse, which is something <clears throat> you also work with, Jamie. Oh, yes. uh, um, and, and it amazes me that 
we haven't, I know you say we've been talking about it a long time, but within our perspective 12 step fellowships it hasn't been something that's really come up a lot that i've heard before as far as addressing the issue it's almost like it's an outside issue if i can coin a phrase um how how do we get let let me ask both you guys how do we get the folks within the 12-step community uh talking about this stuff i have a lot of feelings on this um you know, in my book, Trauma on the Twelve Steps, I talk a lot about how my first sponsor was willing to talk about it. And I think because that was the case, that's why I stuck around when I first got sober. Um, you know, I all, I love what Dan says about sending people into a traumatized field because I think by yeah. and large there's a resistance even within 12 Step. You know, take professional community outside, but just in the meetings. There's a resistance to work with trauma for a couple of reasons. You know, one is, well, we're here to deal with our addiction, you know, and we know those debates go on in the fellowships all the time about, you know, should you be talking about outside issues? And I think some people get so rigid about what meetings should be instead of addressing what, you know, what's really going on with people. And that's some, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book I did, Trauma in the Twelve Steps, because it has a dual audience for both counselors and sponsors. Because I think this issue of trauma is something sponsors need to be aware of as well. Um, because we'll just be creating healthier meeting cultures, healthier, healthier sponsee sponsee relationships. If we just get an awareness going about what trauma is, that, you know, it really is hard to separate the two, the heart, you know, the trauma from the addiction. And we're really doing people a disservice by saying, you know, oh, don't drink, go to meetings, you know, just work the steps. You know, there's a reason that a lot of people don't stick around, and I think not wanting to have these difficult explorations about the trauma is a big reason why. I really, I love Jamie's book, uh, Trauma and the Twelve Steps. I mean, I um, when I, I immediately reached out to her when I learned about it, and um, I recommended all the trainings uh, that I go to, uh, that I lead, just simply because I think it just, is such a wonderful conversation and discussion about how trauma shows up constantly in the 12 steps. I mean, if you look at Bill's story, Mm. you see trauma everywhere. Yeah. Uh, When you read the stories in the back of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, you hear trauma. The thing is, is that we didn't always have the construct of trauma. And so we talk about abuse. We talk about this, we talk about that. And in the context of the steps, there's a lot of great healing that has happened. But then there's a lot of people, because of not knowing about trauma, that have re-traumatized people in the recovery community. And it happens all the time. I mean, it's like living a lot of times in a giant, dysfunctional, alcoholic family (laughs) where we're all trying to get sober, but we haven't (laughs) looked at our ACOA issues, our codependency, our trauma, Mm. and we're just bouncing off of each other, praying to God that some of us stay sober. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. And so I think there's a bottom line, and I think those of us who see it and who get it, um, I feel passionately... Um, have a responsibility to be talking about it, talking about it with the people we sponsor, talking about it. Every time I do a lead, every time I'm invited to speak somewhere within a 12-step fellowship outside of my professional career, right. I always now talk about it. And I I didn't. I, I didn't for a long time that I was even doing this work. And um, I think similar to... Uh, other issues that used to be considered outside issues, I think this will ultimately, 10, 15 years from now, I think it will not be uncommon for us to be sitting in a meeting to hear people talking about how they have also been healing from their trauma or what happened to their sobriety when they really began dealing with their trauma. Because right now, the sad thing is is that there's there's almost this complicit belief that says, you know, when you have 15 or 20 years of sobriety, deal with your you deal with your trauma because it's kicked your ass enough. And you know, like I think I can speak for Jamie when I say that's completely unacceptable. And those of us who stay sober that long are the exception to the rule. So um, I, I mean, I'll get on a soapbox about this anytime. And anybody who <laughs> wants to call it an outside issue, you know. Um, <clears throat> I, I just I, I can't I can't get behind that. I I I, I totally agree with you. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and Jamie, you said something about you know we get so stringent about outside issues. And the deal of it of it is, 
if it is associated with my recovery, it is if it's associated in any way with my illness, then it is not an outside issue. It's very much an inside totally. issue. Yeah. Totally. And something I agree about is the reason so many people have difficulty with steps four and five, I really believe are related to trauma and unresolved trauma. Because, you know, there's a great slogan that unless you do a fourth, you'll pick up a fifth. Or yeah. if you don't do a fifth, you'll pick up a fifth. I mean, I think the reason there is so much resistance to do those steps, which are phenomenally healing steps, is because people are so flooded and that's, you know, trauma related. And this is why people can get a good amount of sobriety under their belt you know, work the first three steps but really struggle with four and five. Um, you know, a lot of special care has to be taken to do those steps in a real sensitive manner that, you know, honors what the steps are about but also takes into an account what might be triggering a person. And so on that token, you know, most especially, of course, it's a recovery issue. I look forward to the day when we have a trauma-informed recovery community. Mm. And, what, and what that means is that every meeting we're focused on safety. Every meeting, we're focused on creating a space of trust and empowerment. And what that also means is that, you know, it'll just become basic knowledge that if somebody is working on a four-step or let's say you're doing a fifth step with somebody and they start talking about abuse, you're not going to say, what was your part? Like, that's one of the ways we re-traumatize people I think in the fourth and fifth step is when they begin to finally have the courage to talk about their abuse. Sometimes after it's their third or fourth, fifth step. Yeah. And we have this, we have this sponsor who in all their own shame and untreated trauma, a lot of the time looks at this person and says, well, what was your part? Your part, you've been carrying this around. Your part is that, you know, you were, you know, you were a really hard kid. You were a pain in the ass. You've already told me that. Your part was this. Your part, and it's like, I say this very unequivocally in a man's way through the 12 steps. I don't care what you did. I don't care how you acted. There is absolutely no your part when it comes to abuse. Amen. And until we emphasize and make, you know, shout that message from the rooftops of the recovery community, yeah. um, I, I you know, I think we'll continue to re-traumatize people in particular with that step, as Jamie was saying. Yeah, and we do we do things like we, we do things like we say, well, you know, she got drunk, so if she hadn't got drunk, she had to have been raped. And so just putting herself in that position, she was asking for it. We say stuff like that, and it makes me sick. It does to me, too, as a woman. And another issue that I think, you know, I'll... I'll keep the snowball rolling in terms of, I'm so glad Dan said about creating a safe space at meetings. Mm-hmm. You know, there are, you know, and I say this unequivocally and passionately, there are some meetings in my local recovery area where I would never send a woman. I would, you know, and I don't know, Dan, how you feel, that, you know, about the male piece. I'll let you comment on that. But, you know, so many women at meetings getting picked up on and, you know, get right. really, I have, I, I see stuff at meetings that makes my, my stomach curdle or turn in terms of just what women feel that they encounter even at meetings or the whole forced hugging, you know, the whole we hug around here. Because, I mean, I'm all for hugs and handshakes, but to me part of being sensitive is recognizing not everybody wants to be touched. That's right. You know, not everybody is ready to be touched. And, um, you know, I think a meeting should be a place where there's safety. I'll tell you a funny story because, you know, both of you know I got sober in Europe in a very small town, and our meetings were very small. Right. And the first time I came to a meeting in the States and somebody hit on me, I was I felt, like, violated. Like, oh, my God, you know, this is supposed to be a safe space for me. This hadn't happened in my experience where I was going to meetings. And, you know, I think issues like that, you know, that ma- that's something that makes me sick, um, just how certain meetings aren't safe places for people to come to because of those trigger issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Dan, you want to comment on the men's side of that? Well, first, um, I just want to reiterate what, what Jamie's saying. I mean, I don't think you can be concerned about men's issues and men's recovery and not be concerned about women's issues of Amen. recovery. Amen. And what I mean by that mm-hmm. is, as men, we have to start speaking up. I don't even go to mixed meetings anymore. Um, but if men are going to mixed meetings, we have to start speaking up about the predators, about the men that are in there who are preying on women out of their own trauma. 
you know, out of their own yeah. stuff that they're doing, their own insecurity, their own sexual confusion, their own lack of sexual confidence, but they're preying on these women. Um, so that's one. That's one of the things that has to stop. Two, we do have to stop talking about it like this is an issue that only affects women. I've sponsored multiple guys right. who have been 13 steps by women, yeah. but we view it sometimes as like, oh, look at him. He's got... You know, he's got six months, he's dating a, a woman with 10 years. It's kind of like we, the same way we shift it in our society, where like a little a young guy having sex with his teacher and hot mm-hmm. teacher kind of phenomenon, mm-hmm. it, it can be equally impactful, equally um, emotional. And so I think, you know, the, the main thing is, I think we have to just stop the collusion and really stop the way that... You know, we're complicit. Those of us who don't say anything, I think, are absolutely contributing to the problem, if not um, if not being guilty. But the last thing I'll say is, but we also cannot, I can't say this strong enough, we cannot then completely isolate those men in particular, but the men and women who are acting out from the community. They need help. They need our healing. Uh, or they need healing. Um, and our support, and we need to figure out a way that we can mm-hmm. help mm-hmm. Uh, everybody to heal, because this is all the face of trauma. And, and I, and I want to say, I'm going to I'm going to say this very, as carefully as I know how to. There are there are men and women who have been thirteen thirteen stepped, so to speak, uh, by members of the same sex. I mean, we sure. we we have we have a, a gay and lesbian community that is healthy and thriving within our twelve step fellowships today, and sometimes that happens and that needs to be addressed. Uh, you, you know, so I mean, boy, this is this is uh, this is really vital stuff, and, and we need to pay close attention to it. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and uh, when we come back, I have a surprise for the listeners, uh, some some fun stuff here, and uh, we're going to be talking more about uh, trauma. I want to talk about uh, some of the rules we put on people that keep them from opening up about their traumatic experiences. Don't go away, folks. More when we return. We understand that having a loved one caught in the grips of an addiction is a powerless position to be in. And we understand this on a very personal level. We have been there ourselves. Our own families have experienced exactly what you are feeling now. The good news is we are here to direct you in finding a way out. We are Freedom Interventions, providing the direction necessary to get the help for your addicted loved one. Your family has specific needs. We can determine the best approach for your specific circumstances. If an intervention is needed, we will provide the direction required to safely and effectively accomplish the goal of recovery for all. To begin the recovery process for your loved one, call toll-free at 888-762-7557. That's 888-762-7557. And visit our website at freedominterventions.com. Freedom Interventions, providing drug and alcohol interventions and a continuum of care services to clients and their families. This is Dr. Alan Berger, author of 12 Stupid Things That Mess Up Recovery. You're listening to Take12Radio.com, featuring recovery talk and positive music. Stinky feet, well I guess I got stinky feet. Metal socks and sticky feet. Nothing wrong with sticky feet. feet. Yes, indeedy. And that is none other than the voice of Dan Griffin, our own Dan Griffin, <clears throat> with his song Stinky Feet. Uh, one of the things that many of you may not realize is that, that both of my guests are uh, quite accomplished musicians in their own right. And I, I knew that about Jamie. I had no idea about, uh, until just the other day about Dan. Uh, that That is actually uh, from his website uh, that where he's working with kids. Dan, that must be a hoot, huh? Oh, I love it. I mean, I... It, it... When it looked like my wife and I weren't going to be able to have kids some years ago, I had already kind of had all this energy come up around that. I play guitar. My niece and nephew were at, with us at the lake one day, and I wrote like six kid songs in that day. <laughs> and um, I just kind of channeled all that energy into that. And then 
they sat there for like five years until this past year where I kind of pulled them out again. And so now I've put up a website, Dan Griffin music, uh, com, And just for fun. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't pretend for a second that, uh, I'm a uh, accomplished musician. I'm just somebody who loves it and loves to play music. Well, I think you're accomplished. It's, it's fun stuff. It's really fun stuff. It, 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 he, it, he played me a couple songs, and I, I found myself very much dancing along with them. Oh, I right on. Honor that spirit. Well, yeah, you you both are very very good at, at what you do, and I I called Marcian and 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 Dan Dan has met my wife on several occasions, and I said, guess who this is. And she she recognized your voice and she couldn't quite place it. And so then I showed her the website and she said, oh, my gosh. She goes, I can totally see him doing that. You know, uh, most people know that Dan is a, is a character. and uh, But he's got a very serious side about him as well. And this issue of trauma is certainly, uh, is certainly a focus uh, of yours. Dan, let me ask you, uh, and I want to ask this of Jamie as well. There's these rules, and I re- I got to tell you, Dan, I really appreciated uh, you and Raleigh uh, doing the presentation at the uh, Cape Cod Symposium on Addictive Disorders uh, on this this thing about these rules that we put on people um, that keeps them from opening up about their traumatic experiences. What are the, some of the rules that we put on each other? Well, and this might be where Jamie and I um, differ a little bit. I'm not completely sure we're still hashing that out okay um but you know a big part of my belief is that men have certain rules and women have certain rules or at least um the idea of being a man in our society being a woman in our society is so strong and for a lot of the men the rules that keep us from you know from talking about trauma is essentially you can't be a man and talk about trauma I mean, yeah. being admitting that you've had trauma means admitting that you have uh, experienced a lack of power, that you are weak, that you um, you know have that you're you're not strong. I mean, at least that's what we think. And so the rules are this kind of way that we structure and and set men up and women up to kind of live according to a certain script. Um, and it's been going on for millennia. Um, but I think the, the truth is, is that there are some ways that we expect men to behave that are absolutely counter to them being able to not only open up about trauma, but even, you know, get into recovery. I mean, we're not supposed to talk about our feelings. Men can't be sad if we're sad or if we cry. It means that we're weak or we're, you know, quote unquote girls or anything like that. Um, and when you internalize all of that shame, when you internalize all of those beliefs, talking about trauma is incredibly different, difficult. I've worked with men for 20 years now, and I've watched men. Men will say, I've, you know, I've experienced violence, I've done this. But when you want to really get them out of their head and into the grief and into the healing component of, of um, processing that trauma, it is challenging because you're working through some of these these pieces. Um, now, there's a lot more complications to it, and yeah. there's you know great people who can really create a really safe place for a man to begin opening opening up to that. Um, but those are some of the rules I would say that keep uh, men from opening up about traumatic experience. Sure, uh, Jamie, are there rules that we sure. put on women too? Well, I mean, I think there are, um, you know, for a lot of us, you know, because I think there is this maybe an assumption that it's easier for women because we are more feeling and more emotional creatures. But I think that's, you know, even a bit of a harsh stereotype because I think there are other variables besides gender with rules that we need to consider. For mm-hmm. example, I think one of the biggest ones is growing up in the alcoholic home. Um, and the whole, you know, rules we get in that home, you know, don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. I think, you know, they may manifest differently in men and women, but essentially if you grow up in that experience where you're not allowed to go there with feelings, of course it's going to be more difficult uh, to be able to talk about trauma. And in working with, you know, clients in recovery, both men and women, that's one of the first roadblocks we have to look at is, you know, where did you get these messages that you can't feel or that you're not safe to feel? 
And sometimes it is, you know, a clear societal message about gender, but other times it's what was taught in the home, and I see that go on in both men and women. You, you bad. Yeah, I think, you know... Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much we want to get into this, this conversation, but I think these are the nuances that we talk about because, you know, as somebody who grew up in a very violent, alcoholic home, like I totally understand what Jamie is saying. I think, um, you know, I'm a trained sociologist, so I think systems, and I also am a trained CD counselor, so I think the micro. So I have a hard time sometimes separating mm. um, those things. I, th- I think all things being equal, you take a man who grows up in an alcoholic home and a woman who grows up in an alcoholic home, or you take a man who grow- doesn't grow up in one and a woman who doesn't grow up in one, I think you'll still find that there are more difficulties not only for men in general, right? I am going to generalize in general to talk about trauma, but for us as people who work with those men and support those men to recognize the trauma, to honor the trauma, to give them a space to create it. I mean, Jamie's coming from a place that I really respect as someone who gets trauma, <laughs> yeah. as somebody who really understands, you know, what that looks like and how it shows up for men and women. But she is the exception to the rule in our field. And so, Part of why I bang this drum so loudly is because until the field is full of Jamie's, then um, I will continue to generalize because we've got far too many men, more so than women, leaving treatment, leaving services without anybody talking to them about their trauma, um, and then going into environments where if you talk about trauma, a lot of the times the implicit You don't even have to come out and say it, but the implicit perpetrator of trauma is who? Men. Almost default. That's when we talk about perpetrators, we... That's who we're talking about. ...mean men. And don't even bring in race, because then it compounds it. Um, And I lastly just want to say, I really appreciate, Monty, your last comment, because I realized I was being very heterosexist in how I was even talking about the issue of 12, of 13 stepping and that, that factor. I mean, the issue of trauma is alive and well in all, you know, communities, right. PLBT, as well as, as well as others. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Um, okay. I, I want to get real personal with, with you for a minute, Dan. Uh, Dan, you've gone through your own trauma. You uh, have, uh, you, you lost your dad. Can you share a little bit about that? Because I want to play this song that you wrote uh, called Memories of You. Can you share that with the listeners? Sure. Well, you know, I mean, it's interesting. I um, I mean, Jamie and I, I think, are both very open about uh, our trauma experiences and, and that being a core part of why we do this. And I think um, that's why maybe we're so passionate. Um, and for me, you know, my father was... a uh, uh, very sick alcoholic um, who died when I was 21. His chronic alcoholism took a very bad turn when I was 14. Um, He was violent. He was a very uh, traumatized man I've learned since he died. Uh, And so I never knew him. And I was, uh, you know, deathly afraid of him. And, Mm -hmm. And at a certain point it turned and I became the man he feared. Uh, and that was the last thing I wanted. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of insanity that exists in alcoholic homes, especially sometimes between men. Um, and uh, the sadness was when he died, um, any chance of that kind of reconciliation, at least between me and him on this earth, um, was gone. And wow. that's part of where the song came from. Was this hard for you to write? No. Yeah. Uh, it was hard for me not to write it. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I get that. You bet. So this was healing for you. Uh, absolutely. I think anybody who does anything with the arts, I mean, I think, again, Jamie and I both believe so strongly that the arts are such a huge part of healing and particularly trauma healing. And so uh, music and poetry have always been a huge piece for me uh, in my healing. Well, here's Dan's song entitled Memories of You. I never wanted it to end this way. I tried. 
tried to save you with the things I said. I hear the echoes of your voice and wish I made another choice. The fear and pain that clouded up my mind. Yeah. Memories of you, Dan Griffin. Okay, we're going to be uh, back right after this. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. I hope you're enjoying this show that we have brought back from our archives. Listen, uh, this has been an incredible journey talking about trauma and the 12 steps with Dr. Jamie Marich and Dan Griffin. Remember, at least once a month, we try to bring back a powerful show that is focused on recovery for you from our archives of 16 plus years of bringing you the best in recovery talk and positive music. So without further ado, let's rejoin the discussion with Dr. Jamie Marich and Dan Griffin, Trauma and the 12 Steps. Uh, my guest today is Dan Griffin and Dr. Jamie uh, Marich, and they are both, uh, they both have a passion for this whole topic of trauma because uh, many of us, we, we go through our 12-step support meetings, we apply and implement the spiritual principles found in the 12 steps, and many times we just jump right over the whole issue of trauma. Uh, let me ask both you guys, because I was asked this question, uh, can trauma be passed from one generation to the next. And let me let me kind of re, rephrase that question. Um, it if I've gone through some traumatic stuff, can I 
can I pass on an attitude? Can I pass on um, the whole deal of don't talk, don't tell, and all that to my kids, and then they don't talk about their stuff? Yeah. I mean, one of the principles of trauma is that until it's resolved and healed, it will continue to fester. I mean, our official term for that is either called like repetition compulsion or trauma recapitulation. It's this idea that trauma is very cyclical. It's very intricate. And, you know, unless the wound is healed, it continues to fester. And, of course, that gets passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. Um, and I can't tell you how many clients I've dealt with who, you know, they're responding to trauma that was perpetuated against them by their parents, but in turn it was trauma that their parents put on them and, and so on and so forth. And even cell biologists are really interested in this phenomenon and how there can be cellular changes over time due to long-term experiences with trauma and oppression in, in, in groups of people. So, of course, it's something that can get passed down. You bet. Have you seen that, Dan? Have you witnessed that? Um, well, I, uh, I, I can't agree more with what, you know, what Jamie's saying. I mean, I, I've, it's been interesting for me. I mean, I, I think my eyes continue to open about the impact of trauma. Um, and I was actually talking to a man at a conference, and I'm Irish, um, and, um, you know, he talked about the generational trauma of the Irish. Mm. And um, until then, I had never thought about it. Mm. Uh, and it was really interesting. It was only a year and a half ago. And um, and then I thought about it, and then I thought about my family, and I thought about my gener- generations of my family, and I thought about it even allowed me to see my father's behavior in a slightly different context. So there's the interfamilial um transmission of trauma. There is the cultural transmission of trauma. I mean, there are people in our society who experience trauma simply because they are not part of the dominant group, simply mm. because they are not part of the norm. Not all of them, but, you know, a lot of folks do. So um, trauma is a very tricky a very tricky thing, and I think Jamie just said it really well. It, it just, um, until until it's healed, it tends to it's a it's an odd thing of how it gets passed down um and in a spiritual from a spiritual perspective i you think bet. there's something very profound happening it, you know uh, one of the things we have to ahead. consider especially if you're struggling with well what does trauma mean i mean trauma simply means wound it comes from the greek word meaning wound mm. and i tell people all the time in recovery or people that i train you know think of everything you know about physical wounds and how they heal and what could happen to wounds if they don't get the proper care? You know, they tend to fester. And I think one of the most, uh, you know, sound colloquial recovery slogans out there is that idea that hurt people hurt people. You know, until things tend to get resolved or healed, we, you know, we pass it on because that's all we know. Sure. You bet. Uh, okay. Now, I, I want to address this this idea that I've I've heard from um, a fellow colleague of all three of ours that there is a concern that if we focus so much on trauma that we'll get away from the application and implementation of the 12 steps. So my question to you guys is how can we marry these two things together. How, how can the 12 steps help us to deal with trauma so we don't skip over this? Dan, do you want to go first? I feel like I can. Uh, I was going to say, you wrote, you wrote the book on it. <laughs> um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit, but Jamie really, I think, can speak to this um, extreme, extremely well. Look, I mean, the truth is there are people who can overemphasize anything. Mm-hmm. We can overplay trauma. There's no question. Um, I get concerned sometimes when I hear some people talking about trauma because they speak about it as if we resolve the trauma, we would resolve the addiction. Mm. So once you clear out all the trauma, somebody can go back to safely using. So, you know, you have you have different extremes. So you have that extreme that basically sees trauma as everything. Right. Um, and you just got to deal with the trauma. Then you have the other extreme, which is you just got to work the steps and you're, there is no real trauma. You're mm. just feeling sorry for yourself and it's self-centered fear and you're playing a victim and you're doing this and that. You know, never mind all the brain research. You know, just get over it. Um, so I think the middle way, you know, the classic middle way um, is, is the place where you absolutely not only can emphasize the 12 steps, but you can use the 12 steps as an incredible catalyst for healing 
Um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, one of the things my book, I think, really attempts to show is that the 12 steps can deal, help us deal with anything if we use them for that. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's the key. Right. Jamie? And, and I think, and I, I think too, you know, one of the misconceptions about, you know, addressing trauma and trauma treatment is that it means we have to go back to the past and dig everything out, and these may be relapse triggers or give people excuses. I mean, can trauma be used as an excuse? Absolutely. You know, it all depends on how we frame it. Because something I talk to professionals a lot about is, you know, you can be doing trauma-sensitive work without necessarily even talking about the trauma just yet. But, you know, like things like helping people learn how to breathe, helping people use good body-based coping skills, be sensitive to triggers, you know, and how certain meetings may trigger people or how certain things may make the 12-step meetings not appealing. You know, like Stan said, I, I wrote a book about it so I could go on and on. But I always look to the example given to me by my first sponsor. You know, she had 25 years sober. She really got trauma. I was a trained social worker, so I think her having some of that professional background helped. But... Uh, something she was able to do was validate everything I went through and not just fluff it off. Like, mm. that's insignificant, you know, because we're, we're cutting off such a big part of a person's humanity, and that's shaming when we do that. And how she approached it was, Jamie, after everything you've went through in your life, you know, in your family history, you know, it's no wonder you became an alcoholic, but what are you going to do about it now? And I think that statement was so impacting for me personally, and that's how I train people now, that we, we can validate a person's experience, but then issue the challenge that, you know, now's the time to work on it. And, you know, I think for people who do use trauma just as an excuse, you know, of course it's going to do more harm than good. But, it, you know, if it can become a way that we can validate and, you know, release people of some initial shame they might feel, then, of course, you know, we, we can work the 12 steps even better. Because I said when I started, I don't think I would have stuck around if I wasn't met with that sense of I honor your story, I honor what happened. Mm-hmm. Really well said from, from both of you. Okay, people want to know more. Whenever this issue of trauma comes up, I, I get emails. People want to know more. So let's start with you, uh, Jamie. Uh, let's let's talk about your websites. you got a lot of websites. Both of you do. I do, uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, on this topic, the best one I would send people to is trauma12.com. It's the number 12 spelled out. Yeah. So T-R-A-U-M-A-T-W-E-L-V-E.com. And I have a lot of resources right up there. You know, some links about where you can get the book, but some videos, articles, some guided meditations that are very trauma-sensitive that people can download. Um, I also have the Dancing Mindfulness website, dancingmindfulness.com, because as you mentioned, I do a lot with the arts as, as, a, as a method of healing. But if people visit either one of those two websites, they'll be able to find me, get in touch with me, and access some more resources. Dan, how about you? Uh, I encourage people to go to www.trauma12.com. Um, so I'll spell out the word. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> I mean, I mean that in all sincerity. Um, I mean, my website's www.dangriffin.com, and it's G R I F F I N.com, or helpingmenrecover.com. And, um, you know, I think I've got some pretty solid resources on there. I could probably benefit from reviewing my website. Uh, but, um, I mean, there's some, there's some really wonderful resources out there that can help people, you know, learn about this. Tian Dayton has written some wonderful um, stuff about the ACOA syndrome uh, and how it's affected by um, trauma. I mean, I could name a... a a bunch of resources, but I, I have some listed on my website. I know Jamie has them listed on hers. So, list. yeah, yeah, excellent, so. excellent. And, and Dan, uh, I want re- to say, Monty, I just oh, sorry, I just was going to say, I just really want to thank you for playing that song. I don't want to take any more time, but I just want to say that uh, that's the first time I've actually shared that song publicly. Really? Um, and I, yeah, and I wasn't, I was not expecting you to play the whole thing, so <laughs> I am just really touched by your. Um, your decision to do that so thank you well a- absolutely and and you both uh I-, I respect both of you so much and uh, what you guys are doing is is just so vitally important and if we don't deal with this stuff if we don't share our experience strength and hope uh when it comes to trauma we're really missing the boat um 
I, I, I just I just thank you so much for your work. It just it means so much to our listeners and, and to so many people. Thank you, Monty. You you bet for giving us the platform. We have absolutely uh, thanks for having us. Absolutely, and I want you guys to come back anytime. Don't wait for me to call you. If you've got something you want to share, if you've got more music, if you've got more books, if you've got stuff you got, you know, at some point, Dan, I, I, we want to talk about your new website. We don't have time today to do that, that you and Dr. Berger uh, have put together, but I, I want to address that. Um, please call me. Please email me. You guys are on the very top of our, our priority list when it comes to requests to be on the show. And we get a lot of requests. I can't accommodate everybody, uh, but but you guys are are definitely a priority because this is such an important issue. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. I know Dan, you have to go, but I, I want to make sure that the listeners hear this song. Uh, that uh, that uh, Doctor Jamie. Do people call you Doctor Jamie sometimes? You can call me Jamie. Oh, okay, mean, okay. I'm, okay. Uh, I'm but, not hung up on titles. Uh, I, I know. Like, Dr. <laughs> Jamie's kind of endearing, though. You know, it's like Dr. Phil, Bob. Dr. Bob, Dr. Mon, Dr. Dan. Uh, tell us about this song that we're going to close out with, uh, Jamie. This song is sure. entitled, I Think I'll Let You. This is a cappella, right? Yeah, it's a cappella. It's basically my version of the first three steps because I had heard that slogan, you know, I can't, God can, I think I'll let him. And I wrote this song when I only had about a year sober just in my guitar because on my guitar because I, I really learned, really learned to play guitar as part of recovery. It was kind of something I did to fill some time. And I wrote this song very early in sobriety, but the recording you're hearing we just did about a year ago, and my brother and father are two of the background vocalists, and that's significant to mention, because my dad was a big source of a lot of my trauma, (laughs) Um, (laughs) and a lot of issues I had to address, and in recent years we've had a lot of healing and reconciliation go on, so I can't tell you how much it means to me that, you know, my dad's voice is on the song. Okay, well, we're going to listen to this song, I Think I'll Let You. This is beautifully done. Here we go. I'm standing at the door of something wonderful and free. Through the window pane I looked at love and joy awaiting. But I'm standing in destruction Misery consumes me On my own I try to ease my pain And there I eat stand I can't, but you
Absolutely amazing. Oh, thank you guys so much for being on the show. Just what a what a blessing. Uh, folks, a special thank you to Dan Griffin and Dr. Jamie Marich. Uh, please visit their website. You can go to the links or at our webpage at take12radio.com. Until our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man along with my special guest this week. We're wishing God's perfect serenity for you. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. She's a super cat, super cat, she's super kitty, meow. You kitty, 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 meow. <laughs> <laughs>